Let's talk about important families of discrete random variables. So, so far we've um, understand what a discrete random variable is. It can be described by a probability mass function. We've seen how to compute the mean and variance. And now let's actually try to simplify a lot of these calculations. So what we'll see as we go along, many of the problems we're interested in have the same underlying fundamental probability structure, right? So maybe in some cases I'm interested in wins and losses, and in some cases I'm interested in whether a coin is heads or tails, and those are both things that are either one way or the other way. So I can learn how to describe these kinds of scenarios with just a few families of random variables, and that way I can avoid um, repetitive calculations. So I can just have a table of important values, and I can just look up the values I might care about, like the mean of a certain random variable. Okay, let's get started with something very simple related to just the example I had just explained. So a Bernoulli random variable is, is when x is Bernoulli p, if it has pmf, which is p of x, 1 minus p for x equals 0 and p for x equals 1, right? So if a random variable has this pmf, then I just call it a Bernoulli p random variable. So if p here would be one third, then I would call it Bernoulli one third. All right, here's an illustration of the PMF. So in this case, I decided that P is less than one minus P, but it could have easily been the other way around. So I could have had um, P larger than one minus P. It just depends on what parameter I choose between zero and one. Um, we can see that the range is naturally just zero and one. And I can also calculate the mean um, in a very straightforward way. So I can just say, it's going to be 0 times 1 minus p plus p times 1. So that's just going to be p. So that's easy. We probably didn't need a lookup table to figure that out. The variance, we'd have to work a little bit harder, and we would find that it's p times 1 minus p. And overall, the way that we can use this random variable is to model scenarios where we have a single trial with a binary outcome with success probability p. Right? So maybe win happens with probability p, and lose happens with probability 1 minus p. What's an engineering application where this might show up? Well, maybe I'm thinking about bit flips in a communication channel. So maybe I'm sending bits over a wire, and some of them are getting uh, corrupted. And I can model that with a Bernoulli p random variable. All right, so let's move on to a geometric random variable. So x is a geometric p random variable if it has the following pmf. So it's p of x which is p times 1 minus p to the x minus 1 for x going from 1 to on to up to infinity and 0 otherwise. So it's basically only taking values on the natural numbers, and it's decaying geometrically as the value increases. OK, to visualize that, I can just draw the PMF. So the first value is going to be p, and it's going to start at 1, and then it's just going to decay from there. So I can see that happening. All right, the range is the natural number, so just 1, 2, 3, and so on. And the mean turns out to be 1 over p. And this is actually a little bit complicated to carry out. So this looks like a geometric series, but when I'm taking the mean, it's x times p times 1 minus p to the x minus 1. And while I could work that out, it's a bit annoying, and it's nice to have this here, so I actually don't need to do that calculation. Same with the variance. The variance is 1 minus p over p squared. Nice to have that and not have to work it out. The interpretation is this is the number of independent Bernoulli p trials I would have to do to see my first success. So let's say I'm flipping a coin and I'm waiting to see when the coin is heads for the first time. I could model that with a geometric one half random variable if it's a fair coin. An application could be the number of attempts I make to get a packet to a router. So I just keep retransmitting it, it fails, it fails, it fails, and finally it succeeds. And I would count the success the trial in which it succeeds is x, and the distribution of that x would be geometric p. All right, next is a binomial random variable. x is binomial np if it has pmf, which is px, which is n choose x times p of the x times 1 minus p of the n minus x for 0, 1, 2, up to n. All right, and this pmf has a symmetric shape, so it starts out low, and then it goes up, and then it goes back down, right? So it's symmetric. And whether it has um, exactly one value at the peak, or if there are two values in the middle here that have the same uh, value, which is the maximum height, just depends on whether n is even or odd. 
All right, and the range is 0, 1 up to n. The mean is np, and the variance is np times 1 minus p. And the interpretation is that the number of successes that I have if I conduct n independent Bernoulli p trials. And in this sense, the mean makes sense because if I'm trying something n times and my probability of winning is p, then I expect to win on average n times p times. All right, an application might be if I'm counting how many times bits are flipped out of, in a packet of n bits, that might be binomial um, np, all right? And next we have the discrete uniform random variable. So x is discrete uniform ab if it has a PMF which is flat and it just takes values on the integers between a and b inclusive. So I have one minus one over b minus a plus one. I run from a to b, and I just have this flat PMF, right? And all I can do is just check that that sums up to one, and that's why I've chosen one over b minus a plus one. And I get these constant values, and that's my PMF. The range is just from a to b, and the mean is directly in the center, so that's just going to be a plus b over two. And at this point, you might be thinking, why do I need to define this family? This is something I could always derive from scratch. It's just going to be right in the center. But once I write down the variance, you're going to see that this is actually a little bit annoying. And it's nice to have this formula worked out for us so we don't have to figure this out every time. right? So where does that 12 come from? Well, if you went through the whole calculation, you would see 12 emerge as you're canceling some terms. But it's nice to not have to do that every time. Interpretation, simple, just equally likely outcomes. What's an application? Well, I could roll a six-sided die, and then I would be thinking about a equals one and b equals six. Finally, we have the Poisson random variable. So x is Poisson lambda if it has the PMF, px, which is lambda to the x over x factorial times e to the minus lambda from zero up to infinity. All right, and this seems like kind of an odd, uh, you know, function to write down, but it's a very important PMF, and it just happens to take this shape. Okay, so for now, don't worry about why the formula looks like this, and let's just try to look at the uh, illustration and learn the mean and variance, and then we'll come to the interpretation. Okay, so here's a sample picture for what the PMF might look like. It might start at some intermediate value, go up, and then go back down. The range, as I said, is just 0, 1, 2, up to infinity. The mean, lambda. The variance also lambda. So those are simple, and it's not apparent at a first glance that if I tried to take the mean for this PMF or the variance that I would just have lambda pop out. Okay, the interpretation is that this is usually used to model the number of occurrences of some event in a fixed time window. Okay, so if I'm, um, let's say I'm monitoring a website, I'm trying to see how many hits do I get to that website within an hour, maybe I would model that with a Poisson distribution if I don't expect to get that many visitors per hour. It's a reasonable choice. Um, what's an application? So different application might be number of photons hitting a CCD pixel in one millisecond. Okay, so that's it for the um, families of random variables we're going to use in the discrete case. There are many, many more families. And basically, if you can think of a family, like something that makes sense, you could probably find it on Wikipedia. You could look up its mean and variance and much more. But these are the five basic random variables that show up very often and that we're going to learn as part of this class. But if you find yourself in need of something that's a little bit different, odds are you'll be able to find that by looking at you know, another textbook or just looking somewhere online. Let's do an example. Let's say that you're trying to watch a few games that played by your favorite sports team, and maybe you know, we're all at home these days, so maybe it's your favorite eSports team. And let's take the following model on how many times they win. Okay, so they win a match with probability 3 fourths, and we'll say that that's independently of every other match that they play, okay? And what I want to do is I want to keep watching until I see my team win once. Okay, so let x be the number of matches that I watch in order to see a win. All right, so the first question that I have is what kind of a random variable is x? And so this is the number of trials that I'm going to conduct to see my first success. So that's going to be geometric. And 
The thing that I need to remember with a geometric random variable is I need to specify the win probability. In this case, that's 3 fourths. And in general, don't forget to write down the parameters. And this is more of an advice for an exam or for your homework. OK, so now that I have that model, what kind or how, sorry, how many matches do I need to watch on average in order to see a win? So if I'm counting how many matches I watch every day and I'm averaging that, what do I expect to see? Well, um, the mean of a geometric random variable is just 1 over p. So I plug in 3 fourths, I get 1 over 3 fourths, and that's 4 thirds. OK. And something a little more complicated, what is the probability that I see the first win on the third match or later. Okay, so I'm watching games and the win occurs on the third game that I watch or a later game. So that's the probability that x is greater than or equal to three. So that's summing up the probability from three to infinity for the PMF. And so I can plug in the formula for the PMF, which is p times one minus p to the x minus one. And I can plug in p, which is 3 fourths, and I get something that I can kind of work with. This is basically a geometric series, but, and I can look up the geometric series and work it out, but I don't want to do that. I want to avoid this calculation. How can I do that? Well, basically the problem here is I have an infinite summation. And if I was lucky enough to have the other side of this um, probability question, which is what's the probability that x is less than 3, that would be finite. And I can actually get to that using the complement property. So I can say, take the complement, I just have 1 minus the probability of x being less than 3. And now I can just simply replace that with 1 minus the probability that x is less than or equal to 2. And the reason I can do that is that I know for a geometric random variable, x only takes values on the natural numbers, so 1, two, three, and so on. So when I'm saying less than three, I really mean two or less and including two. So that's one minus the PMF of one plus the PMF of two. And so that's one minus three fourths times a fourth to the zero minus three fourths times a fourth to the one. So that's one minus three fourths minus three sixteenth and that's one sixteenth. And that's my answer. Okay, moving on, let's look at a slightly different question. Let's say I count how many wins I watch in six matches total, okay? What kind of a random variable is y? All right, so I have a fixed number of matches. They're independent. I'm just counting how many wins I see. That's binomial. And n in this case is six, and the win probability is 3 fourths. So now I can use the uh, properties of a binomial random variable to work out the variance and also the second moment, okay? So the variance, I already have a formula for that. That's going to be np times 1 minus p, and that's 6 times 3 fourths times 1 fourth, which is 18 over 16, which is 9 over 8. For the second moment, I kind of have to work that out directly as a starting point. So I plug in the formula y squared times the PMF, and then I end up with y squared times the you know, formula for the PMF of a binomial, plugging in n equals 6 and p equals 3 fourths. And then I realized that while I can do this computation, it's just six terms, I don't want to do it. Okay, can I avoid doing this by hand? So here's another trick I can use to get the second moment once I already have the variance. For um, you know, the alternate variance formula, I have that the variance is equal to the second moment minus the mean squared. So I can just move the second moment over the other side of the equation, and then I can solve for the thing that I'm after. Right? I already know the variance, and the mean is easy to work out. So the variance we already determined, it's going to be 9 eighths, and the mean is going to be np, because it's a binomial random variable. So 6 times 3 fourths squared, so that's 9 eighths plus 9 halves squared, so 9 eighths plus 81 over 4, and that's going to be 171 over 8. So just putting on the same denominator. And finally, what is the probability that my team wins less than half the matches, given that we're playing six matches, right? So um, we need to translate this into a probability question. So I'm going to just put that I'm interested in the probability of 
um, y being less than 3. And remember that since this takes values on integers, that means that y is less than or equal to 2. So now, you know, I'm just faced with summing up the terms in the PMF, 0, 1, and 2. So I have 6, choose y, 3 fourths to the y, a fourth to the 6 minus y. So I just plug in, I might as well just plug in. There's nothing I can really do to simplify. So I get 6 choose 0 for y equals 0. Then I get 6 choose 1, 3 fourths to the 1, 1 fourth to the 5 for y equals 1. And then 6 choose 2, 3 fourths to the 2, and 1 fourth to the 4 for y equals 2. And that works out to 154 over 4,000. 96, and you can check that on your own. All right, so let's just ask one more question related to this y. So let's say that I already know that my, you know, someone has already told me before I went to sit down and watch my six matches that my team is going to win less than half. Okay, so they're going to win less than half the matches. I'm kind of disappointed, right? So I know they're going to win less than three matches. And I'm hoping that at least they're going to win two matches now that I have this spoiler that they win less than half. So how am I going to work this out? Well, this is a conditional probability question, OK? So we're going to see how conditional probability comes into play for a discrete random variable, all right? So in this case, the event I'm interested in is a equals a is y equals 2. And b, the thing I know is that y is less than 3, which is the same as y is less than or equal to 2. So the conditional probability of a given b is the probability intersection of a and b divided by the probability of b. And so I'm just going to plug in my definitions for a and b. So I'm going to get the probability of the event that y is equal to 2 intersected with the event that y is less than or equal to 2, Okay, divided by the denominator, which is just probability that y is less than or equal to 2. Now, on the numerator, the only thing that survives is just the probability that y is equal to 2. And what's nice about using um, these kinds of conditional probability uh, tools on discrete random variables is usually the intersections are very easy to work out. So I have probability of y is equal to 2 over what I learned from part f, right? Because we already worked out this probability on the last slide. So I just have 6 choose 2, 3 fourths to the 2, a fourth to the 4 over 154 over 4096. And this thing on the top just happens to be, you can work it out, it's 135 over 4096. And that's nice because now the 4096s are going to cancel out, and I'm going to be left with 135 over 54. And that's going to be it. So that is our uh, brief introduction to the families of discrete random variables.